today. We have the pump um, in the back. We have Dr. Bowen and Dr. Gustafson, and then uh, in a bit, a, a few of the perfusionists will come by too when we're done. If you guys want to kind of go through the circuit as well, but um, so the kind of topics of discussion today. If I can find my cursor. We'll talk just a little bit about the role of cardiopulmonary bypass. Focus really on kind of the circuit and its components. Uh, a couple brief slides on kind of the pathophysiology, and then try to run through an example of kind of the basics of um, kind of conduct or, or commencement of cardiopulmonary bypass and then weaning uh, someone at the conclusion of a case. There, I have a single slide on some example emergency scenarios. We're not going to run through those uh, today. Um, so ultimately speaking, the, the primary goals of cardiopulmonary bypass are, are a few. Number one being kind of a bloodless operative field uh, by emptying the heart and, uh, and the operative field. Really, you want the ability to safely arrest and, and restart the heart without injury to the heart, and that comes in the form of both cardioplegia, but then also back to the first point of keeping the heart empty and, and decompressed, because we know that the number one determinant of myocardial oxygen demand is, is wall tension. Um, and then while this is all going on, we have to continue to perfuse the brain and the body without injury, and so the pump also needs to handle the pulmonary function by taking over oxygenation and ventilation while it also perfuses. Um, the secondary goals of the use of cardiopulmonary bypass offer us the ability to adjust chemical and electrolyte components of the blood, uh, adjust the body uh, temperature, and to really recapture operative blood loss as well to, to minimize true operative blood loss during the case. In terms of how to learn the pump or familiarize oneself with the pump you know there are a lot of components oh sorry um sorry i think some folks at home are not muted maybe okay um and uh it, i think it's it's honestly a little bit unfair to to ask someone to just kind of look at this sort of diagram and learn it um and so another way that it is frequently shown is here again, it's more complex. And so we'll try to kind of break it down. I'll use this kind of cartoonified version, label everything and then simplify it and go through them. But basically the, the key components are going to be your cannulae, your venous reservoir, your oxygenator and your pump. Those are, are really the basics that we'll start with. And then we'll, we'll add on one thing at a time. We'll add on the ability for cardioplegia delivery. We'll add on Benson suckers and we'll add on kind of the heater cooler as it's paired with the oxygenator and kind of go through these things. So. Uh, from a simplicity standpoint, this is kind of the, the, some of the most basic aspects of the pump, your, your arterial and venous cannulae, your pump itself, and your oxygenator. Important aspects of these things when you're thinking about your choice of an arterial cannula or, or different aspects that may make it advantageous or less advantageous. The tip of the cannula can be a consideration in terms of whether it's angled or straight, uh, whether or not it is, is beveled or has a more kind of perfusion tip. Uh, as shown here, these the bevel tip being on top um, and the perfusion tip uh, being one that would cause less direct turbulence. For instance, if someone had a very atheromatous aortic arch or our distal ascending aorta, whether or not a cannula is wire reinforced or non-reinforced, the advantages of the wire reinforced cannulas being that it can allow higher flows at a smaller uh, cannula caliber, um, though it may or may not be more uh, cumbersome to place depending on who you ask. And then, you know, different components just from a technical aspect of the flange on the end of the cannula, this kind of button aspect, which helps secure it um, for anchoring it to the aorta. And when you, when you consider all those things, then you make a choice in terms of what cannula you're going to use. Back in the old days, they would actually have the scrub nurses like put these together on the back table, choosing each component. But ultimately now we, we really just use proprietary cannulas of the surgeon's preference. Um, the manner in which the aorta is cannulated is that after placing two partial thickness uh, purse string bites um, and securing those with Rommel tourniquets, the aorta should be entered sharply, um, sometimes with an additional kind of adventitial flap in the operator's finger to control things, after which uh, the cannula is inserted and, and snared uh, and secured um, and kind of, you know, de-aired thereafter. When we're considering venous cannulation, um, there's different venous cannulas as well. There's what we call kind of dual stage and single stage cannulas. Dual stage cannulas will be those that have kind of side holes a little bit more proximally and at the tip for multiple sites of drainage. Uh, they're very useful as shown here, kind of when cannulating the right atrium and then feeding it into the IVC, for instance. And then single stage cannulas would be those that are placed either directly or indirectly into the IVC for additional components of uh, true right heart isolation. Uh, with or without sneering of the cavity. 
um, important anatomic considerations when, when cannulating the, um, the atria are shown here. Uh, certainly, you know, you want to avoid uh, cannulating more so on the medial aspect of the right atrium or anywhere near the atrioventricular groove as you can have injury to the right coronary artery. You want to avoid cannulating near the sinoatrial node. And then depending on the patient's anatomy, sometimes the, the right atrial free wall can also be somewhat friable, a common site of access being the right atrial appendage if you're going to use a multi-stage cannula. An example of single-stage cannulas being used for indirect and direct cable cannulation are just shown here um, by way of example. Uh, and if you're going to indirectly cannulate, you, know, you obviously would likely be snaring the KV for, for true isolation for cardiopulmonary bypass. The, the choices in terms of your venous cannulation site are you know variable these are all kind of relative to one another it's not that one is perfect and one is is less perfect but um in terms of the true uh drainage of the right heart and completely isolating the right heart the best way to do that is going to be with direct superior and inferior cable cannulation and snaring those cannulae um the uh selective uh cannulation uh, that's indirect will be sort of an in-between and then atrial cable cannulation is not going to completely isolate the right heart, but it's not necessarily mandatory for all intra for all extra cardiac procedures like cabbage, for instance. Uh, in terms of the likelihood of potential kinking of your cannulas when the heart is decompressed and being moved, uh, whether that's, you know, during the time of a mitral valve operation or when doing a, a lateral wall revascularization during a cabbage, different cannulation strategies will be more or less likely to kink as well. And then in terms of the technical difficulty, this is all relative. I think, you know, theoretically, the, the direct by cable cannulation would be more difficult than cable atrial cannulation. But if it's, you know, in the hands of a certain surgeon who, who does these sorts of things every single day, um, then it's going to be, you know, relatively straightforward if that's their daily practice. Um, the key consideration when choosing your venous cannula arrangement, though, is this final point at the bottom, really that any opening of the right heart to allow air and communication with the cannulas is going to entrain a large amount of air into your circuit. It can cause something called air lock, which can interrupt flows to the pump and, and actually cause really more of a pump emergency. And so it's based on kind of your anticipation of whether or not you're opening the right heart uh, or if you need to um, uh, do anything in the right heart uh, in terms of your degree of uh, uh, cannula isolation of the right heart uh, for your choice at the outset of the operation. It's not generally something that's done on the fly. Um, and then finally, with the venous drainage, this all goes to a venous reservoir. There are what we call open and closed or hard and soft reservoirs. Um, the, the real take home point is the bottom uh, point that the hard reservoirs, although kind of easier for priming and management at the bedside, there is more of a SERS effect uh, as all of the SERS effects related to cardiopulmonary bypass has to do with blood coming in contact with varying degrees of a surface area of non-endothelialized tissue. And there's more of that surface area effect in the setting of an open reservoir. The soft reservoirs are a bit more, uh, I, you could say difficult to manage uh, from the perfusionist aspect, but they are uh, something that offers less of a surface effect and ultimately I think some patient benefit. That's what you'll see on this uh, pump here when we go through it later. Um, and then finally, just a brief bit about the pumps before we go, yes sir. Yes. Sure. So, um, I mean, a large portion of it is by gravity uh, from, you know, the, the venous reservoir should be, you know, lower than the patient. Um, and then really that is the, the primary aspect by which it will drain. Um, the, yes. Yeah. And then um, things that can limit that drainage for instance, would be if a patient is, you know, starting an operation volume down or rel you know, underfilled uh, from that perspective. Uh, if, you know, for some reason, you know, there are technical considerations and the bed is all the way down or the pump is arranged in a manner that you need to kind of increase the distance between the patient and the reservoir. And then as a backup, as Dr. Bowen alluded to, we can use something called vacuum assist or kinetic assist, where a negative back pressure is applied to the venous circuit to aid in drainage uh, into the venous reservoir. Um, 
assuring that there's no communication between the cannula and the open air because otherwise you would entrain a massive amount of air and probably cause an airlock um, to kind of get things started. Yes, yeah. And then a brief bit about the different pumps that we use really for the, the main pump on the circuit, we're almost always using centrifugal pumps here shown on the, the left. Um, these are what's called after load dependent, um, meaning that the, the flow that's generated will be dependent on the after load against which the pump is pumping. Um, it's the same as, as an ECMO pump, for instance. So maybe somewhat counterintuitively, um, if there is a, a higher pressure that the pump flow will go down. Uh, it's not something like a roller pump that is after flow independent and will just continue to pump regardless of the afterload against which the pump is pumping. The benefit of the central fuel pump being that um, there's less hemolysis and it can, can sometimes provide a better flow characteristic. Um, there was originally some concern that it was non pulsatile, but ultimately the downsides of the roller pump uh, have outweighed its original benefits. And then one thing to consider is that if it's afterload independent, even if someone were to inadvertently clamp a line, for instance, the roller pump would continue to pump and you would place your circuit at risk of rupture at any site of weakness, for instance. So, I'm sorry? Yes, yes. It's, it is, these are all things that are described because they've been seen, um, I guess you could say. Um, so we'll just, we'll add in a few components as we go along. One to, to also consider would be kind of how you're going to deliver cardioplegia to stop the heart. Um, just from a basic sense, the uh, two methods of delivery are going to be antegrade or directly into the coronary ostea or, or what's called retrograde or into the coronary sinus, uh, the largest of the coronary veins. At the top are just examples of some antegrade cardioplegia cannulas. The ones on the, in the middle also have a, an aspect of uh, the ability to vent the heart. Um, and then these are examples of retrograde or coronary sinus cannulas. Antigrade is used in almost every case, sometimes where it may not be adequate or may not be uh, as useful initially would be in patients who have wide open aortic insufficiency. If you can imagine, if you're going to try to put cardioplegia into the root of the aorta and they have wide open AI, it's really just going to fill and distend the left ventricle. And then it, in some patients who have really tight proximal coronary disease, um, there's some concern about whether or not you would fully isolate or, or arrest the heart if you're only giving antegrade. And so retrograde is a, a very useful adjunct um, for a number of reasons. The one consideration being that it may not fully protect the right heart because the coronary sinus actually has some, it drains the majority of the heart, but there are other veins within the, the right ventricle that drain directly into the cavity or through the great cardiac vein uh, that are not gonna be met by the retrograde uh, cardioplegia. Um, this is just a, an example of kind of where each goes. Um, the anterior catheter typically going right here in the aortic root, the retrograde going through the right atrium into the coronary sinus, uh, either by feel or with some assistance from echocardiography. Um, and then one other thing we'll talk about are, are vents and suckers. They are useful really for recapturing operative blood loss and to prevent distension of the heart. Um, a, you know, kind of a semantic difference. Vents are, are to evacuate blood from within the heart and prevent distension and rewarming. You might say, okay, well, I have the the KV snared and I'm inflowing through the aorta and I have a clamp in between, how, how is the heart going to distend? How's it going to get blood? Really, there's actually a significant amount of, of blood that does drain back into the heart, um, you know, one to 200 cc's every minute from bronchial veins. There are other cardiac or Thabesian veins that drain directly into cavities. And if you're sitting there and just letting the heart distend, you're, you're going to cause a lot of myocardial injury. So venting the heart during a case is very important. And then suckers are there to recapture operative blood loss, either back to the, the pump itself or uh, whether that's the cell saver. And then one last component being the, the heater cooler as it's paired with the oxygenator, we'll talk about it. Uh, membrane oxygenators are really kind of the only oxygenators in use uh, these days. Um, they offer a much less service response, uh, better diffusion control of gases and less microemboli compared to kind of historic bubble oxygenators. Um, and then the heater cooler is a component that um, uses kind of a, a 
heated coil with a, a water bath uh, to adjust the, the temperature of the blood as it's flowing through. Um, and then one, one question that will come up commonly is whether or not the heater cooler should be before or after the oxygenator. I think it's a common source of confusion. It should, it should be before the oxygenator uh, to prevent things like uh, microemboli uh, and um, uh, kind of what's called outgassing, or if you have you know, a diffused component of oxygen, for instance, in the blood, and then you heat it, um, it will form microemboli and th that can cause you know, particulate effect as opposed to if it's heated before, you'll just get your, your diffused component. Um, and so with that, we've kind of briefly run through and kind of put together a lot of the pieces of the pump to hopefully make it a little bit less intimidating, um, kind of describe each of these each of these things. And then there's obviously safety adjuncts as Dr. Bowen was alluding, alluding to, you know, these mishaps that we describe are things that they're described because they've happened before. It's not just a theoretical risk when putting someone on the bypass machine. Um, we'll change gears briefly and uh, talk about the pathophysiology of cardiopulmonary bypass and sort of what is the patient effect from being put on pump. Um, in, in general, you know, there is a large degree of, you know, a blood interfacing with a non-endothelialized surface, which activates a number of, you know, clotting factors, in the complement system, cytokines, and it in total, you know, kind of induces cardinal manifestations that include both thrombosis and bleeding risk, vasodilation, a diffuse kind of capillary leakage with sometimes a picture that can appear similar to almost a distributive shock um, and uh, an associated susceptibility to infection. It, it causes, you know, widespread organ system effects as shown at the bottom of this slide. Um, to go into just a little bit more detail, um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, it's common to see a little bit of myocardial edema and decreased um, myocardial contractility and also arrhythmogenicity immediately in the perioperative period. There will be vasodilation and capillary leak. Uh, bleeding from both platelet dysfunction and factor consumption, uh, depending on your degree of replacement. Um, patients can suffer pulmonary edema. There can be increased flow through intrapulmonary shunts and associated atelectasis from the period where the, the lungs are essentially turned off while a patient is on bypass. Uh, from a renal standpoint, there's an immediate volume load that a patient receives um, when being put on pump. And depending on the degree of hemo concentration while being run on pump, they can leave the OR with a significant volume overload, uh, as well as vasodilation and capillary leak. So they may appear volume overloaded in terms of edema, but also intravascularly dry. Um, and then from a, a CNS standpoint, there's obviously the risk of hypo perfusion at low pump flows, but also microemboli like we talked about. And then uh, from a GI standpoint, ileus is actually fairly common after uh, cardiac surgery, as well as kind of risks for microemboli and stress ulceration. Um, to briefly try to put things together in the last 10 minutes or so, but you know, there's kind of, we'll talk briefly about kind of the key steps to kind of, if you wanted to kind of get someone on and get someone off. And this is sort of how I think about it to simplify it into kind of four steps to, to start someone on bypass and four steps to try to get someone off bypass. So you would when thinking about the initial conduct of bypass, you need to establish the circuit kind of as we described it. You need to you know, give your initial start and check some parameters. And then when you're fully ready and safe, you can go on and sort of do the, the inverse to come off. So you would restart the heart and the lungs, recheck parameters, try to come off and then dismantle the circuit. So um, things that need to be considered when establishing the circuit, obviously these, these patients need to be anticoagulated. Uh, the initial heparin dose is shown here at about 300 units per kg, but ultimately the way that that is checked is by checking an ACT uh, or activated clotting time. It generally needs to be greater than 400 to initiate cardiopulmonary bypass, higher to go on stroke arrest. But once you achieve an adequate ACT, this is rechecked throughout the case uh, with heparin redosing as needed. Um, the pump can be primed using a very, you know, varying methods. Generally, a crystalloid priming solution is what is found in the pump and then depending on kind of surgeon and perfusionist preference, I think something called retrograde autologous priming can be something used to mitigate the initial volume overload seen when someone is started on bypass. Um, once everything is primed, the, the lines are passed up onto the, onto the sterile field for anyone who's been in the OR and seen this and they're divided. And to Dr. Bowen's point, you know, excess tubing is, is you know, attempted to be minimized within the circuit as you get ready to connect your, your arterial and your venous cannulae. Um, and when you're dividing these lines, obviously, you know, the pump should be off so that you don't divide the lines and then spray the surgeon or the assistant. Um, and the venous line should be clamped so that you don't divide the lines and then entrain a massive amount of air. Um, the cannulation then kind of ensues as 
previously described, and the arterial cannula obviously has to be fully de-aired before connecting and initiating any type of flow that would return to the patient and cause initial air emboli right when the pump is started. Um, and then once you kind of have that set up, the patient is cannulated, you think you're ready to go, you would ask the perfusionist to give it, um, an initial test. Um, you wanna make sure that you're able to flow at certain parameters, achieving an adequate cardiac index, that you're achieving adequate kind of perfusion to the body in, in the form of the map. Uh, you could check kind of the body, the heart and the pump are things that you should kind of run through whenever you're doing this. So the body is that being perfused, the heart and, and your cannulation sites, is there adequate decompression where you've uh, cannulated for your venous site? And is there evidence of any immediate complications at your site of aortic cannulation, like an aortic dissection? And then is the pump able to achieve adequate flows? This, this A line pressure that I described here is in the pump arterial line, not the patient's arterial line, just for clarification. Um, and then making sure that there's adequate flow and reservoir capacity uh, before going on full bypass. Um, there can be considerations for high line pressures, mostly related to cannula positioning and iatrogenic dissection. And then uh, poor venous drainage, again, related to cannula positioning, position of the heart, position of the table and reservoir in relation to one another, and then whether or not the patient needs vacuum assistance, um, and if maybe the patient needs some additional venting. Uh, in terms of a description of additional sources of blood reaching the heart, um, you know, blood that will reach the right atrium is going to include coronary sinus blood, uh, blood from the great cardiac vein and the vesian veins, as I described. Um, blood to the left atrium will be from your bronchial veins, and then from the LV will be from any source of aortic insufficiency. And so these are all things that need to be considered before you just say, okay, we're good, we're ready to start this procedure. Is the heart adequately decompressed with your venting? Um, and then a lot of the vent considerations are also going to be based on what you would anticipate uh, based on your planned operation as well. Um, so at that point, if you're ready, you know, then the anesthesiologist turns off the, the lungs at the ventilator and they start what they call their golden hour. And then the surgeon just stops the heart with cardioplegia uh, and you're ready to, to commence the, the operation from a simple standpoint. Um, to try to flip that sequence of four steps on its head, we'll briefly run through weaning a patient from bypass. Um, in order to get ready to wean someone from bypass, you have to rewarm. Um, generally, this is done slower than any cooling because it, it can't be done with it, it's such an active process. Um, over rewarming also risks creation of not just microemboli, but neurologic injury. And so, you know, even if you're, it involves kind of standing there for a few minutes, you really can't rewarm more than about half a, half a degree centigrade per minute. Um, the the de-airing process is something that we've probably all seen when in a cardiac OR, um, and it, it entails kind of evacuation of air, if you can imagine, everything from your venous cannula to your aortic cross clamp. So you'd start by allowing venous blood to fill the right heart, massaging the heart or allowing the right heart to eject and go to the lungs, ventilating the lungs uh, so that any additional um, air is, you know, evacuated, um, and also allowing some additional blood to return to the left heart, maybe with some air that can also be vented through an aortic root vent or your LV vent. Um, and then you'd also insufflate CO2 into the field for something that can diffuse rather than room air and be really trapped in the blood. Uh, you'd initially uh, or initiate or place at least your temporary pacing wires. And then you want to run through kind of your, your basic criteria to really start to wean the patient from, from bypass. You know, there's no physiologic conditions that continue to require CPB. There's no residual air. Uh, they're at a physiologic temperature and, and electrolyte parameters, and they have satisfactory pacing and ventilation. Um, in terms of the, the actual steps, you know, it's really more of a cycle in terms of allowing more and more blood to fill the heart by clamping the venous line, allowing uh, the heart to continue to eject to a greater degree by reducing the assistance of the arterial inflow, and then kind of repeating that cycle in close communication with the anesthesiologist and perfusionist until one is totally off bypass. And that would be when the venous line is totally clamped and you're not providing any additional inflow. Um, at that point, you know, dismantling the circuit is um, something that's done also in a stepwise fashion, just with starting with the venous cannula removal, but keeping purse string should one need to go back on bypass. Um, you can take out your aortic root vent if your de-airing is done. And then the, the final step being removal of your uh, aortic cannula and closure of those purse strings. Um, once the, uh, you know, everything is looking good, you're hemostatic, maybe you've started your test dose of protamine um, without evidence of a protamine reaction. And then the dose of protamine to be given is just shown here at the bottom, it's just one gram for every 
hundred units of heparin is kind of a quick calculation, though ultimately it will also be aided by rechecking your ACT prior to administration. Um, and a, a key component is obviously not to give this, you know, while a patient is still on bypass in any form, um, as you know, again, it's something that it, it can be done and uh, it can cause acute thrombosis of the pump and, and really an acute emergency uh, if it's done out of sequence. Um, I tried to kind of talk fast and get through the bulk of everything. I have listed a couple of emergency scenarios uh, more so for reference than really to discuss, but hopefully with you know a few extra minutes, we tried to leave some time for any additional input from Dr. Bowen or Dr. Gustafson, or for folks honestly to come up and kind of run through the circuit uh, with, with Carlos, um, one of our perfusionists, um, and kind of make it a little bit interactive and show and tell. I don't think that we need to run through or discuss these things, but um, hopefully now everybody feels ready to put somebody on pump. But, um, um, but that was kind of the quick and dirty. I think th the reason to talk about this is I think it's a, a, a big black box um, when folks step into a cardiac OR. It's something that we may take for granted as something that kind of unlocked a lot of additional procedures that we now do kind of as a matter of routine. And to some degree, some of what we talked about will be germane to further discussions. We have guest lectures on ECMO. In a couple of weeks, we'll have a little ECMO journal club as well. So thank you. Um, that's all I have. So you guys are free to ask questions or free to, to kind of come up and join Carlos.